So welcome back to the second half of these two lectures on dense linear algebra and how to make it go as fast as possible. Let me just, I almost finished the first half on matrix multiply. There are a few slides left. So let me just review a couple of them and then finish that topic. And so our goal was to take the usual n cubed algorithm initially. We'll get to Strassen in, in a moment. But minimize the amount of communication because that's the most expensive thing you do. So I wanted to set the goals and, and say, do we know what the lower bounds are on how much data you have to move? And so here's a slide that we put up last time to, to tell you what that is. And so this is a lower bound on data movement that applies to not just matrix multiply, but anything we're going to do in these two lectures. And as you'll see, it applies much more broadly. It can be generalized. So the question is, you have one processor. It's going to do a certain number of floating point operations. It could be a, sequen you know, a sequential implementation, so it's doing all n cubes, say. Or it could be one processor out of many parallel processors, so it's doing one piece of all the work. In any way, the number of words it has to move is the number of flops it does divided by the square root of how much memory it uses locally. That could be the cache size, or if it's a smaller, you know, if you're not out using all the memory, it's however much memory you actually choose to use on that processor. So that's the lower bound on the number of words moved. And then the number of messages sent, the latency cost, that's also expensive. Well, you just take the number of words moved and divide by the largest message size. That tells you how many messages you have to move. And the largest possible message, well, it could be a cache size, but clearly a message can't be bigger than the whole memory. So this is just a factor of m smaller than that. And as I said, this holds for just about everything uh, that smells like three nested loops. And it, we will talk about Gaussian elimination when I get to that part of the lecture. And uh, as I said, there's a proof, but I will not probably go into it. And so if we just plug in specifically for dense matrix multiply so we know what our goals are, so this is all I'm going to do now is in the sequential case, the number of flops is n cubed. And so we get n cubed divided by the square root of the cache size. That's what we had before. And in the parallel case, so now we have to work, you know, now we have to make some assumptions. I'm going to assume it's load balanced. So every processor is going to do one piece of the work. Otherwise, you, know, you don't have to communicate at all if you just ignored all but one of the processors. So the number of flops will be n cubed over p. I'm going to assume that there's one copy of the data. So the, the number m, how much uh, memory do I use? That's n squared over p. I'm going to load balance the memory, reasonable assumption. And then if I plug that in, I get the number of words moved equal to these two quantities, n squared over root p and root p. So the question is, can I, can I attain that? And then I said, well, why do I have to assume I'm only going to allow myself one copy of the data? So I, if, I'm, if I have a lot of processors, each one has memory, I may be able to fit multiple copies of my data into all that memory. And so let me now add another parameter, which is how many copies of the data I can actually fit into my hardware memory. So my memory per processor is not going to be n squared over p. It's going to be c times n squared over p. When you tell me how much memory you have. So if I plug that in, I discover that the number of words moved goes down proportional to the square root of the number of copies. And the number of messages moved shrinks proportionally to the 3 halves power of the number of copies. And so that is really my goal now, to make all of linear algebra run this fast if I can. And in, if you look historically, people had discovered an algorithm that attained this lower bound in one special case. And you know, these references go back a long time. For the special case when you have p to the one-third copies of the data. And why did they happen to choose that particular number? Because there was sort of a natural way to think about the algorithm. You took all your p processors and you laid them out in this cubical grid. And each processor sort of did you know, something inside this cube of possible matrix multiplies. And so, but the point is you don't always have p to the one-third copies of the memory for p to the one-third copies of all the data. And so it turns out there is a new algorithm that attains it. And I showed this one performance plot last time, where by using 16 copies, 16 was the magic number that was best on this particular very large parallel machine with 16,000 nodes and four cores per node, so 64,000 processors. And, it, and by doing 16 copies, it went, well, 12 times faster in this particular case and 2.7 times faster in that case. And so the vertical axis here is the execution time. Here's for the algorithm with one copy. Here's the algorithm with multiple copies. And the colors tell you where the time went. So red is communication. That shrank 95%. Uh, there's some blue idle time because you, had to, you sat around waiting, unfortunately. And the green is the flops. And so these improvements are well worth making. 
And so this was done on a square uh, for a square matrix, and it was very highly tuned to this particular computer, which has a three-dimensional torus interconnect. All the processors are connected to their neighbors in three directions, and uh, this optimization was done very carefully by hand. If you don't have such a machine, you'd still like to run the algorithm. And there are extensions to this done by some of the people in the front row here. Um, who figured out how to extend it to uh, sort of general topologies. You could be oblivious to that. It didn't have to be square anymore. It sort of did divide and conquer in the right way. And they can also asymptotically attain this. So now, let me, yes, question. Why is it fewer flops? And it, it's not fewer flops. So the question is, why did the green bar here shrink? And that's because uh, each processor is doing locally a larger matrix multiply. It's calling the local DGEM on a larger matrix, and it gets better cache utilization purely locally. And so, so that's why it spent less time doing just the flops, because it actually is doing the same number at a higher rate. So that was a good thing, too. OK, so now I just want to say, how does all this scaling work if you use these algorithms? And I'm going to claim that by using all the memory, you can have something we're going to call perfect strong scaling. And so the idea is, every time you add a processor, the processor comes along with some memory, right? That's how processors are built. And so we should always use that memory. So the question is, how do we organize the algorithm so whenever a processor comes along, we also use you know, all the hardware resources we get? So let me show you how these formulas predict how things scale. So I'm going to start with the fewest processors I can possibly use. So now M is going to be the per processor memory. And if I have P processors, that's the total memory in the machine. And if I'm going to do a you know, matrix multiply, that has to be at least 3n squared to fit 3n by n matrices. So let me start with p that small. And so now I'm going to ask, how does this algorithm scale if I increase p by a factor of c? Say I double the number of processors, then my total memory is also going to double. Let me use it all and see what happens. And so I'm, let me just write down the timing model again so I, get, so I can see what happens to the timing. So this is the same notation we had before, but I'm going to use a subscript t to indicate time, because eventually I'll talk about energy. So I'm going to count the seconds per flop, the seconds per word move, that's the reciprocal bandwidth, and the seconds per message size. And, and now I'm going to be completely general. A message could be whatever size the hardware likes. It's little m. And if I take all the formulas I had on the previous slides and just write them down, here is the time it takes to run the algorithm on c times p processors. And so it's all proportional to n cubed, no surprise. There's a c times p in the denominator. And all of this is just a hardware constant. All of these numbers, the gamma, beta, alpha, they only depend on the hardware. m is a memory hard number, and little m is also a number. So all of this, all of the hardware dependency has been factored out. That only depends on the algorithm, and it scales perfectly. If I increase the number of processors by a factor of c, the time drops perfectly by a factor of c. So the flop time dropped proportionally. The, the bandwidth time drop proportionally and the latency time drop proportionally. So that's why we call it perfect strong scaling. So now let's ask the same question about energy. Let's see if I can write down a formula for how much energy it takes to solve the problem. So now this um, is, so now I have to ask where does all the energy go in a computer? Well, whenever I do a floating point operation, that takes a certain number of joules and that can be measured. And so I'm going to let gamma sub e, e for energy, be the number of joules per floating point operation. I'll let beta sub e be the number of joules per word moved along a network. And let me say that computer architects you know, have gone over this model, and they kind of agree it's a reasonable model. And I'll let alpha sub e be the number of joules per message to sort of pack it up and send it out over the network. Now, that's where some of the energy goes. But there's also other places energy goes, like the memory. It takes energy to store a word in memory. So let me let delta be the joules per word of memory used per second. So in other words, you have a, a word stored in memory, and it, la it sits there for a second. That's how many joules it takes to you know, keep the memory turned on. And then finally, there's one more term, which is how many joules per second for everything else. Because the machine is kind of leaking energy all the time. There's fans. There's whatever else. And so uh, let me just all throw that together in this epsilon term, joules per second. So now I can write down an expression, which is, which is kind of messy. And there are all the terms put together. So here's the energy for all the floating point and all the, the, uh, the communication, the, the bandwidth term. There's the alpha term. Here's the term for all the memory. So, so let's just see what it is. It's the total amount of memory, m. It's how long I keep it turned on, the time to run the algorithm, time the joule, times the joules per second. So that's the uh, memory energy term. And then finally, 
here's the, you know, the leakage and all that. That's also proportional to the time it takes to run the algorithm. So that t is the same t as up here. So here's this big, messy expression. And the question is, how does it scale with c? And the answer is, it doesn't depend on c. So if I double the number of processors, it takes exactly the same amount of energy to solve the problem as it did before. So how can that be? If I double the number of processors, I'm using twice the power for half as long. So, so that's why it kind of works. So there's no overhead for running the problem faster in this nice, simple, linear model, which you know, sort of remains to be validated, but we sort of believe that's true. Now, this can't go on forever. At some point, there's gonna, you're going to hit a limit. You can't keep you know, using more and more memory forever. So it turns out that if you look at the theory, the limit is the algorithm that people discovered historically many, many years ago. You can't use it more than p to the one-third copies of the data. That's the hard limit that you hit. And if you, where does that come from? Well, one way to see it is that if you look at the lower bound on the number of messages, let me just go back to that slide. If I pick C equal P to the one third, the lower bound of the number of messages is one. That's kind of an, an you know, going below, below one doesn't make sense. That's not a proof, but it gives you some intuition as to why you can't use more than P to the one third copies of the data. And so, uh, so th that's, that's the limit. And so it also is true, and I won't do all the details now, that this idea of perfect scaling, that the time decreases proportional to the number of processors and the energy is constant, it applies to a whole bunch of other algorithms too. It applies to Strassen's matrix multiply. I'll talk about Strassen in a moment. It applies to the direct end body algorithm. You're not going to use this in homework two, but there's a, a variation of that algorithm that you're doing in homework two that has also this perfect scaling property. We'll talk about it in a later lecture. And there's some papers there that you can read about that if you want. So now let me just say a few words about Strassen. So all of this has been about the you know, n cube algorithms. So let me just tell you briefly what the story is for these other algorithms, which don't do n cube floating point operations, but do n to the, well, 2.81, log base 2 of 7. So how does parallel, so, so here are lower bounds that apply to Strassen, and, and it's a different proof. So the number of flops in the classical n cube algorithm, that was n cubed over p per processor, Strassen can also be parallelized. It's now n to the, let me call it omega, divided by p. So n to the 2.81 over p, so that you can parallelize the, the flops. What about the communication lower bound? Well, here's what, the, here's what it was in the previous slide. It was n, the flops divided by the local memory size. Let me just write it here so you can see that 3 up there. All you have to do is change the 3 to 2.81, and you get the lower bound for communication for Strassen. That, that's not a proof. It just happens to be a wonderful coincidence because it's a completely different analysis that gives this lower bound. But it, it, the lower bound for communication is also lower for Strassen you know, by changing a 3 to a 2.81. The number of messages also decreases. The 3 changes into a 2.81. And it's all attainable. Again, by using replication of the data in a clever way, you can you know, use all the memory you have available up to a limit and hit these lower bounds. How much memory can you use? Well, in the n cubed algorithm, I said you hit this lower bound when you had p to the one third copies of the data. And th that was when the message lower bound hit one. And now it's this funny thing here. It's, one it's p to the power one minus two over omega. If you plug in omega equals three, you get p to the one third. But now omega is 2.81. And that's the limit on how much replication you have and get this perfect scaling. And uh, so anyway, this, this also got a different award. And so the question is, how well does this work in practice? So let me just show you some speed up numbers. And so here's some uh, performance data running this algorithm. So this is for a fixed problem size. And, and so uh, a large matrix. The horizontal axis is the number of processors going from 49, which is a convenient power of 7, which is what Strassen likes. But you can run Strassen for other sizes too, all the way up to several thousand processors. And the vertical axis is, if you like, the effective gigaflops or the efficiency. So, so this tells you how many floating point operations per second kind of each processor is doing. So a perfect algorithm would be have a perfectly flat line. It would be perfect scaling. You know, if you, you know, if you double the number of processors, each processor is working equally fast. And so I'm comparing a whole bunch of different algorithms here that do different numbers of floating point operations. So Strassen, our Strassen is up here. And I'm comparing it to standard matrix multiply. So, so what does gigaflops mean? So really the way I do this is I take the time to run the algorithm and um, I take n cubed divided by the time to run the algorithm. So I sort of 
it's really just pro inversely proportional to time. So that me means I have a fair comparison between Strassen and, and standard matrix multiply. So if Strassen is like three times faster, that is three times higher than standard matrix multiply, that means it, it takes three times less time to run. So it's, it's sort of a fair comparison. And so here is the usual algorithm with no replication. So this is the n cubed algorithm out of scale pack with you know, one copy of the data. This next green line is the algorithm I told you about, the optimal n cubed algorithm. It has as many copies of the data that, as it can usefully use, and it goes faster. These blue lines are previous attempts in the literature to parallelize Strassen. They didn't quite get it right. They sort of you know, had various hybrids of Strassen and regular. And then the red one is the new one, which, has, which is almost perfectly flat for a while. And that tells you it's perfectly scaling, right? I double the number of processors or increase it by a factor of seven, and I get the same you know, flops per processor. Yes, question. Do, um, you want to use a mic? How much do you think this depends on the value of n? Like if n were smaller, how would this picture change? So, so if n were smaller, there would be a bigger... So that's a good question. So there, there are two competing effects there. If n is smaller, and I use lots of processors, then the communication is going to be more dominant. And the, the part of the algorithm that tries to get rid of the communication will be even more important. And so I will get an even bigger speed up compared to the algorithm that, doesn't, you know, that isn't clever with replication. On the other hand, the difference between n cubed and n to the 2.81 will become less relevant, and the extra overheads of Strassen will become more important. So the answer is we've got to measure it and see what the data tells us. <laughs> so, yeah. OK, so that's all I wanted to say about um, matrix multiply. Why am I telling you so much about it? It's because it's the bottom of the software stack for every other algorithm. Right? So when I tell you about the other algorithms, I'm only, only going to talk about one in detail, which is solving linear systems in Scalapack. So it's going to call parallel blahs. It's going to try to reorganize Gaussian elimination to spend all its time doing matrix multiply, because that's what we know best. And then that matrix multiply is in turn built out of all these other parts at the bottom. So when we build the software stack, we, build, you know, we take the blahs, the, the, the scalar sequential matrix multiply that you guys you know, worked on in homework one, that's a building block for the parallel blahs, and that's a building block for everything else, like solving linear systems and so forth, which we'll get to next. So let me now close this first you know, lecture that I should have finished last time with just a hint that all these lower bounds are very general, and they kind of extend to pretty arbitrary programs. So, so how do they extend? So the, the, for the one that I just showed you, for things that smell like three nested loops and matrix multiply, the lower bound looked like however many flops you did, divided by the m to the 1 half. So where m is your, your cash size. And so here's how, and, and 1 half is a magic number. Where did it come from? I didn't tell you the proof. But here's how, let me just tell you how it generalizes. So it turns out that for any program that kind of looks like nested loops, not necessarily 3 in matrix multiply, as many as you like, and that accesses arrays, not necessarily you know, a, b, and c, as many arrays as you like, and where the array subscripts all I'm going to assume is that there's some linear functions in the loop indices. So they don't have to be a sub i j. They could be you know, 3i minus 4k plus 5j, anything you like, just linear combinations. Then it turns out there's a magic constant s so that the number of words moved in that algorithm is however many inner loop iterations you do divided by m to that magic power. And so for, the, and, and for matrix multiply, you know, s is 3 halves, so you get m to the 1 half. And so where does that three halves come from? There's this classical theorem from geometry from the 1940s due to Loomis and Whitney that we use to model the algorithms. And so I'm not going to go into that proof. But that has been recently generalized to deal with much more general kind of loop nests by a team of very pure mathematicians who weren't thinking about computer science. But it turns out that's exactly what we need to answer this computer science problem. And so it, it extends, so in addition to linear algebra, it applies to n-body problems, it applies to database joins, it applies to you know, anything that looks like loops and arrays. That's a pretty general class of problems. And there's lots of open questions there. And depending on the timing, you know, I may come back later to this topic later in the semester. OK, so that ends the, the lecture that I began last time. And now I'm going to go on and talk about Gaussian elimination and, and how do you do the optimizations there. But are there any questions about this? Uh, OK, so let me give you an outline of now what's left. So I don't have to recall matrix multiply anymore. I just did that. 
I'm going to remind you of the sophomore version of Gaussian elimination and reorganize it to show you how you can spend all your time doing matrix multiply. So I'll, it'll take a few slides just to remind us all of that. Um, then I'll tell, us, tell you how to optimize Gauss elimination in the sequential case. And then I will do uh, the parallel case. Now it turns out that to, in order to hit the lower bounds, it's not enough to simply schedule the operations differently which, and, and maybe replicate the data, which is what we did for matrix multiply. We actually need a different numerical procedure. Right? So you may have heard about this algorithm called pivoting, partial pivoting, and, and if you learned about Gauss elimination, we can't do that anymore. It turns out if you do that, you can't hit the lower bound. There's a different kind of pivoting that does work, different from the one that you learned yeah, a long time ago. So I will tell you how all that works, and then I'll have a few slides that summarize the progress for, all the, for the rest of linear algebra, like least squares and eigenvalue problems and so forth. And then, depending on how much time is left, and there may not be much, there's a, there's a section on, which is specifically for multi-core. How do you do the dynamic scheduling of all the processes on multi-core? And, and so we could talk about that. Or I could talk about how it all maps to GPUs. And that's interesting because you, it turns out that GPUs are only fast for some of the subroutines you need to call, for some of the operations. So you need to split the work and schedule it correctly between the CPU and GPU. So that's another topic, so heterogeneous processing. So let me now go on, and I'm going to skip this because we've done it already. And so let me go on to remind you of the sophomore version of, of Gaussian elimination and then take a few slides to bring it up to the version we're going to actually optimize. And so here it is. What do you do? You take multiples of each row of the matrix, add them to the later rows to zero out uh, each column. So I'll take the first row, add a multiple of it to the second row, third row, and fourth row to zero that out. Then I'll take the second row, add multiples of it to the following rows to zero at the second column, and so forth, right? So that's, that's the familiar version. Let me write it out as loops, and then I'll modify the loops. So for each column, I need to zero it out below the diagonal. And so I'm going to loop i is going from 1 to n minus 1. They're all the columns. And then for each row, j, below that i, so below the diagonal, I'm going to have to add a multiple of row i to row j. What's the multiple? There's the multiplier. And so here is the loop that actually takes row i, there's an i, multiplies it by a scalar and adds it to row j. Okay, so that's the starting point that finally gives us an upper triangular matrix at the end of the process. So what I'm going to do in the following slides is I'll put the code at the top and then I'll do one optimization. And so each slide for a few slides is going to have one optimization until I get what I want. So the first obvious optimization on this code, which was on the previous slide, is it's kind of silly to redo this division in the inner loop because it's the same constant. So let me just do that division once, and I'll put it in an in, in M multiplier, and so I'm just going to re-multiply every time. So picture-wise, I'll take the quotient of that entry in the diagonal, store it in M, multiply that row by M, and subtract it from there. So that's an obvious optimization. So there's that code again with M. So here's the next optimization. So it's pretty silly to compute what I know. And what do I know? I've zeroed out that column. So let me not bother to actually do a subtraction where I know the exact answer is zero. Let me just forget, let me just not bother updating that column. All that does to the code is instead of looping from the ith entry of the row to the nth, I'll loop from the i plus first to the nth. Okay, that's the next optimization. And so I put that code up there again. So the next thing I'm going to do is take that multiplier, and it turns out I'm going to need to use it later. So I need to put it somewhere. Where am I going to put it? The obvious place to put it is in that entry I would have zeroed out. So what I'm going to do is take that multiplier and put it in the jith entry, which is the thing that would, would have become zero, and I'll just leave it there, and I'll use it later. So I'm going to be overriding the bottom triangle of my matrix with these multipliers. And I'll tell you what they're good for later. So this, is, this hasn't changed any arithmetic. So there's that code again. And so the next optimization is, is a very simple one. Um, I have this loop and I'm doing two things. I'm taking a column of the matrix and dividing it by the diagonal. Let me just do that all first, finish computing that entire column, which just says divide it by the diagonal, and then do everything else in a separate loop. So that's pretty straightforward. So there it is. And now I recognize this is sort of the, the simplest version of the code. It's really three lines of MATLAB. So what is this loop here? This loop says, please take a column of the matrix below the diagonal and divide it by the diagonal. That's a single call to the blas one, which I've now written in MATLAB notation. In rows i plus one through n, column i, divide by the diagonal. 
or multiplied by the reciprocal. So the next thing, and so here's the picture of the algorithm. So suppose I've finished now, I've gotten up to I. I've here all the multipliers, they're done. Here's all the upper triangular part of the matrix, that's done. I'm now just working on this. And so this first line of code takes that column, divides by the diagonal. What does the second nested loop do? It's really another single call to the blahs. I'm taking this column, multiplying it by that row, and subtracting it from that square submatrix. So I'm doing a rank one update to the trailing submatrix. And here it is in MATLAB notation. So this, is, this thing here is rows i plus 1 through n, columns i plus 1 through n, and I'm subtracting a column times a row. So that's a single call to the blahs too. Okay. So let me now put my three lines of code at the top. That's what Gaussian elimination is really doing. And, and so now let me state a theorem which may be familiar. So remember I had all these multipliers that I left behind in the lower triangle. What are they good for? So let me call that lower triangular matrix of the multipliers M. So it lives just strictly below the diagonal. And let me build implicitly a matrix, a lower triangular matrix with ones in the diagonal. So this is a lower triangular matrix. Let me call the output of Gaussian elimination that we got from the very beginning, the upper triangle that was left, U. And it turns out that what I've done is I've factored A into the product of L times U. So let me write it this way. So A was my original square matrix. L is a lower triangular matrix. U is the upper triangular matrix. And so I've done this factorization. That's what the output is of Gaussian elimination. And that's how the software that everybody does actually solves AX equal B. There are three steps. The first one is the algorithm I just showed you. You take A and you factor it into L times U. And I should say that L you know, lives in the lower part of the matrix. You just know that there's ones in the diagonal. You never have to write them down. And then U is the usual stuff that lives above the diagonal and on the diagonal. And that costs, if you do the operation count, 2 thirds N cubed. And then, how do you actually solve AX equal B? There's two more steps. I'm going to do two triangular solves, two more calls to the blahs. So if I want to solve AX equal B, the first step is you solve LY equal B with this L matrix. That's a triangular solve. You solve it using substitution. That's N squared, very cheap. And then the second step is you solve UX equals Y. So Y is the output from there. So I solve a second triangular system of equations. That's another single Blois call, triangular solve. And I get another N squared. And I claim the X is the answer. So let me just confirm that with one line of algebra. I want to confirm that A times X equals B. Then, I, then I'm done. So let me factor. I factored A into L times U. So let me write A as LU. I'll just move the parentheses around. So here's U times X. U times X is Y. That's where Y comes from. And L times Y is B. So I get AX equal B. And so that's how all the, soft, uh, the software is organized. Now you may say, well, why wouldn't I like compute the inverse of A and then multiply by the inverse? That's a bad idea. That triples the cost and gives you a less accurate answer. So this is the right way to do it. So let me just write that code again and say, are we done? And the answer is no. There's two problems with this three lines of code. The first one is, what if I divide by 0? Right? So I have to worry about that. And 0 is not the only problem. If a is tiny, I'm going to have some problems. So I need to worry about pivoting. And the second one is that I'm spending all my time doing blahs 1 and blahs 2. And we know from the last lecture that's a bad idea. You know, we want to spend our time doing matrix multiply. Otherwise, I'm going to be running at the speed of memory, not the speed of floating point. And, and here's the usual picture. I'll be running at the speed of blahs 1 and blahs 2, not the speed of matrix multiply. So I need to reorganize this to you know, fix, to get the right answer, not divide by 0, and also to spend my time in matrix multiply. So let me talk about the first problem first, which is pivoting. So let's suppose I want to solve AX equal B on this little 2 by 2 matrix. The very first thing the algorithm will try to do is divide 1 by 0. And that's a bad idea. So, but this is obviously a very simple linear equation to solve. And so what we're going to do in this case, it's pretty easy, is you just do, you reverse the order of the equations. You put, you swap rows 1 and 2, then there's no problem. And you continue with the algorithm. That's called pivoting. So let me just tell you what the classical way to do it is. And, it turn, as I, and it's still widely used, but it actually does not hit the lower bound of communication. So here, this is the, same, the black stuff is the same three lines of code I had before. And all I've done is I've inserted the pivoting part. So what I do is when I get to column I, let's, uh, is I look for the biggest guy left over. So I do a search for all the entries on and below the diagonal and pick out the one that's largest in absolute value. 
And this is so common, there's another single subroutine in the BLAS to, to do this operation for you. So that's another BLAS call. So then you say, I found the largest entry. If it's zero, well, I have a singular matrix. I'm done. I, I have an error message, and I return. Otherwise, if, uh, if the biggest guy is not on the diagonal, I have to swap rows k and i. And then I can continue as, as I from before. And so now when I do this division, I've done it so that the biggest guy is on the diagonal. Oops, excuse me. The biggest guy is in the diagonal, so all these quotients are less than or equal to 1 in absolute value. And you can use that to prove that you know, numerically you're in good shape. So, what, so I'm no longer computing A equals L times U. That's what I had before when I didn't do any pivoting. So do, what do I have instead? I have almost A equals L times U. I have A equals a permutation matrix times L times U. So I'm really doing LU on just a matrix where I've permuted the rows. And so everything I did before the solving, it's all done easily. And this is a standard subroutine. We're going to use it as a building block for the real fast algorithm. But you know, I can't use this in general because I'm still spending all my time in BLAS1 and BLAS2. But I'm still going to use this as a building block. So, so the next problem to solve is how do I reorganize it so that I spend my time doing matrix multiply instead of rank one updates? And so the idea, of course, for matrix multiply is I want to somehow find blocks in the matrix so that I can multiply one block by another. And it's trickier here because, of course, I have dependencies, right? It seems like I have to finish updating with the first row and first column before I can do anything. So the idea is, and this applies to lots of linear algebra problems, is I'm going to delay the updates. I'm not going to update the entire trailing matrix using the first row and first column. I'm going to wait because I don't need them right away. And I'll wait a while, and I'll collect a whole bunch of updates. Let's say I'll collect B updates and and, and, and not and wait to apply them. So once I've collected B rows and B columns, I can apply them all at once. And it turns out when you apply them all at once, it's a matrix multiply. So what I have to do is recognize that by you know, saving up all this work, I can reorganize it and it becomes a matrix multiply. And then that's where all my time goes. And there's lots of problems, and this works for many of the algorithms in linear algebra and other things too, although we can't, it doesn't, you know, there's still open problems. I'll, I'll give you a hint about that. So here's the idea. I'm going to show you the algorithm in the next slide. We're going to choose a block size. That means I'm going to choose, I'm going to say, I'm going to save up B columns to update. And I'm going to do them the slow way using the BLAS1 and BLAS2. And then, and, but that won't be slow because I'll choose it so they all fit in cache. So the idea is you pick B columns. B is small enough so that that part fits in cache. It'll run fast. And then you save it up, and then you apply them all at once. So let me show you how that algorithm works. And so, so here it is, and I'll walk through the algorithm one step at a time. So, we're going, so here's B, so I'm going to process the matrix B columns at a time. So I finished processing that part of the matrix. There's my L factor, it's finished. I finished that part of the matrix, that's the U factor. And I'm working on this trailing submatrix, and I'm going to process B columns at a time. So, I, so, so the loop goes by steps from, of B. So, and, and, this is, and so the indices IB is the first column, end is the last column of that block. So the first thing I'm going to do is take this submatrix here, this tall, skinny, rectangular matrix, and I'm going to do the LU factorization using the subroutine that I had before. And so I'm going to factor this matrix here, this tall, skinny rectangle, which I've drawn here, into a product of L, that's a lower triangular matrix, times U, that's an upper triangular matrix. It happens to have that funny shape, but it's the same algorithm, right? And I'm going to use BLAS1 and BLAS2 and regular old pivoting to factor that. So that's the first step. And when I'm done, the U factor is, is overwrites and it lives up there. So that little triangular U, that's where it fits. And then the lower triangular L, it's, it overwrites and it fits right there. Okay, so that's going to be a call to the BOS2. So the next step is I'm going to, I'm going to re, just to give it a name, I'm going to let this little square lower triangular matrix, I'll call it LL. And what I need to do is use that to update this matrix. So what I do is I call a single BOS3 operation that says, Please solve triangular systems using this triangular matrix and all the columns of this. So that's a single call to the BLAS3. So I solve a triangular system with the first column, the second column, the third column of that pink matrix. A little hard to see, but it's pink. And that's a single call to the BLAS3. And I can get the hit the lower bound by doing that. So at this point, I have that pink matrix. I have that blue matrix. But I haven't touched the green matrix yet. I have to update it. And that's where all the work goes. It's a matrix multiply. I multiply the blue times the pink, 
and subtract it from the green, and that's exactly the work that the classical algorithm would have done, but I've, now I've done it with a single call to the blahs. And if you want to see a proof, you can go look it up somewhere else, but that's the basic idea. So all the, it's the same operations. So let's see, let me show you some performance data now. This, as I said, it doesn't hit the lower bound, but it's a heck of a lot faster than the previous algorithm. So here's some rather old performance data on some old machines, but let me show it to you anyway. And so this is sh uh, comparing the speed of the algorithm I just showed you to several benchmarks. So the black line is the speed of the algorithm I just showed you. Um, let, me, let me do it this way. Let me do the green line, divided by the hardware peak, right? You absolutely promise you can't go faster than the hardware peak. And the vertical axis is a fraction. It can get as high as one. And so you can see the green line is for this, let's see, um, I think it was a thousand by thousand matrix. It's getting to be a pretty large fraction of the machine peak. So that's pretty good. Uh, except on this platform. We had a little trouble with that one. So um, let me, um, that, I'm sorry, that is the red line. I'm taking the speed of LA pack divided by the speed of matrix multiply. Let me apologize. That's the, that is, because matrix multiply is the fastest we can possibly go. And this says what fraction of matrix multiply speed. So you can see it's going between 60 and 90% of matrix multiply. The green line is how fast the inner loop, the matrix multiply went. And that went almost, you know, 90 or more percent of peak, except on this one platform. And then this blue line is the speed of this algorithm I just showed you compared to somebody's best hand-tuned code from the vendor where they were doing it using their own ad hoc methods. And it gets a pretty reasonable fraction of that, of that peak method. So let me compare these two processors. This is, uh, these are the same machines, but it's a Cray C90, except with one processor versus 16. And with one processor, it was close to fully, uh, you, know, you know, efficiency of equal to one. But we went down to 16, the communication kicked in, and we're only getting 70% efficiency. That, so that's the price you pay for having that. OK, so this is a good idea, uh, but it doesn't, you can see the communication is still a problem. We still are paying for it. So we'd like to minimize that to the extent that we can. So let me convince you in one slide that if we have a lower bound for matrix multiply, it's automatically a lower bound for Gaussian elimination. And it's a very simple idea because I can encode matrix multiply inside Gaussian elimination. So here's a matrix, and it has, it has, these are all n by n blocks. Let's suppose I did Gaussian elimination on it. What's the answer? You can write it down. There is L, and there is U. And hiding inside of U is the product of A times B. So any algorithm you know, for Gaussian elimination has to cost at least as much as multiplying A times B. So this is sort of an easy way to see that you know, my, all my lower bounds apply for matrix multiply naturally apply to Gaussian elimination. So the question is, can I attain it? So now let me go take that algorithm I just showed you and, and, and on one slide, I'm not going to do all the counting, but just sort of summarize and ask, does the algorithm I just showed you hit the lower bound in the sequential case? So here's the algorithm that I had before, just copied. And it turns out there are three cases. Sometimes it does hit the lower bound, and sometimes it doesn't. And the first case is when the matrix is so huge, you can't even fit a single column into cache. And it turns out that if you do the careful counting, you do hit the lower bound. And because you spent all of your time doing matrix multiply, and the right size to pick for the block size to hit the lower bound is the square root of the cache size and you spend all of your time doing you know, matrix multiply of the largest possible matrices that fit in cache. But this is you know, unusual that your matrix would be so big you couldn't even fit a single column into cache. The second case is when the matrix is so small the whole matrix fits in cache. In that case, it's sort of trivial. You just bring the whole matrix into cache, do whatever you like, and put the answer out again. That sort of trivially hits the lower bound. But in the middle, which is where most matrices are, where it's too big to fit in cache but one column fits in cache, it does not hit the lower bound. And, uh, and the problem is you can't pick that block size um, to both simultaneously make matrix multiply go as fast as possible and so that this BLAS2 version of the algorithm doesn't you know, turn into a bottleneck. And so uh, anyway, it doesn't work. And so we need to have a different idea. So let me give you a couple different ideas. And the first one is in the spirit of cache oblivious. I want to have a recursive algorithm. You, you remember we had a recursive matrix multiply that just broke the problem into half size problems and then called itself recursively. You can do the same thing for Gaussian elimination. And it works partially. And so here's the idea. What I'm going to, in, here's, here's the algorithm in one line in English, and then here's the, uh, the code. 
I'm going to take my matrix and break it into the left half and the right half. I will do Gaussian elimination on the left half. I'll use all the information to update the right half. Then I'll call it recursively on the right half. So it's just going to be recursive left and right. You know, I'm not going to break it up. In, in, I'm not going to break up a row. I'm just going to break up the columns in the left and right. So here's how you write the code on one slide. So it's going to be called recursive LU decomposition. And I'm not going to put in pivoting here yet. Let me, I, I'll leave that out. Um, so if I only have one column, there's not much to do. I take the matrix, I divide by the diagonal, and I'm done. So, that's, so I have a single column that's very easy. So now my matrix is going to be M by N, right? Because I'm, going to get, I'm not going to have square matrices when I do the divide and conquer. So the first line of code says, break up the matrix in the left half and the right half, and call the recursive LU on the left half, and factor it into L times U. So I will get an L1 times U1 that equals the left half. So that's the first line of recursive call. So the next thing says, please take that L11, that's the same L11 I had on the previous slide, and do a triangular solve with that block. So I, do a, I call a single BLAS3 operation, triangular solve on that square submatrix with that triangular matrix. So that's a single BLAS3 call. That's uh, that line of code. And then finally, I have to update the trailing submatrix, and that's the same thing as before. I take that green submatrix, but I multiply the blue times the pink and subtract from the green. A single matrix multiply call, and I update the trailing part. And now I call myself recursively on the trailing submatrix, and I factor that into L2 times U2, and I'm done. Okay, and uh, so that, that is the algorithm. And if you want to analyze it, Here's the code again. I've just repeated it. It, ta it takes only like a few lines of, of algebra to analyze it. Let me just sort of sketch it. So let me write down a little recurrence relationship for how much memory I have to move. So this is a function which is how much memory I have to move between fast and slow memory to do an M by N LU decomposition. And I need both parameters, right, because the matrices are changing size in both rows and columns. So the first line of code calls itself recursively on a problem with half as many columns. So I just copy the function over here, and I have to, I have to, so it's same number of columns, half as many, half, same number of rows, half as many columns. Then I call um, you know, a triangular solve and a matrix multiply, and so I get that term in there, which is just sort of the classical uh, cost that we did in the last lecture for matrix multiply. And then I call LU again, and so it's on, on a smaller submatrix, which has n over two fewer rows and half as many columns. And so here is a recurrence relationship. And I can solve it in the, you know, solving recurrence relationships are pretty easy. And it turns into this, the number of flops, mn squared, divided by the square root of the cash size, plus a little extra term, which doesn't matter most of the time. So this does indeed hit the lower bound for the number of words moved. It has the same nice property that all of our um, cache oblivious algorithms have, is that the algorithm nowhere had to know about the size of the cache. And in fact, if I had multiple levels of cache, it would have handled it all automatically. But it doesn't actually do everything we want. It does minimize the number of words moved, but it doesn't minimize the latency. It doesn't minimize the number of messages. I didn't because of pivoting. There, there's no pivoting in this algorithm, but if you throw in pivoting and you have to you know, move a lot of rows around, it doesn't minimize the latency. But we recently discovered a way to fix it, and so there is a class project, if you're interested, to take our new version of this algorithm and implement it and see how fast it actually goes. Um, it's not clear to us. I mean, it does asymptotically hit the lower bound, both for latency and for bandwidth. But whether it actually you know, is faster than this, we don't know yet. So, but anyway, so that's the current status of that. So that's all about the sequential versions of Gaussian elimination. And so now, now let me talk about the parallel version and for where we really do have to replace partial pivoting with something else in order to, to get to the lower bound. And so let me just remind you of the different steps we have to go through to parallelize this. So first of all, I have to figure out what all I can do in parallel, so identify enough parallel work, but, but not too much, because I need to have you know, a reasonable amount of work for each processor to do. Then I have to uh, you know, load balance it, assign the work to processors, and uh, decide which processor is doing which to maintain locality. And so let me just talk about decomposition first. And, and point out there is an awful lot of parallelism in this algorithm. Let's just look at the BLAS2 code. What is this second line doing? It's taking you know, this number times that number, that, that column entry times that row entry, and subtracting it from a matrix. 
That's like order n squared things I can do in parallel. They're all independent. And so if I had n squared processors, I would only need 3n parallel steps to run the algorithm. But that's, you know, that's too much parallelism. I, I can't uh, afford to assign one multiply and one add per processor, so I need to block it in some way. So let's go back and explore the different ways. This is, you know, this is too fine-grained. So let me go back and remind ourselves of our data structures that we're going to use to assign work to processors. So the idea is we're going to assign submatrices to processors, and that processor will be responsible for the work to update it to maintain locality. So, so here are the different possible layouts that we, we talked about before for matrix multiply. And so let me walk through them one at a time. This first one, where if I have four processors numbered from 0 to 3, and each one would get a quarter of the columns, that's a bad idea. Because by the nature of the algorithm, I'm sort of always working on a trailing submatrix to get smaller and smaller. So after the first n over 4 steps, processor 0 is completely done, right? I've completely finished that part of L, and there's no work to do. So the load balance gets worse and worse. I don't want to do that. And if I did it row-wise, I'd have the same problem. So here is a better layout. No matter which trailing submatrix I look at, every processor owns a quarter of it. It's perfectly load balanced. But there's no BLAS3 stuff going on, right? There are no dense submatrices in this layout that any processor owns. So, so processor 0 owns every fourth column. So I can't call the BLAS3 there. So I can't get good local performance. So there's a compromise where I choose some block size where I can get decent performance from B by B matrix multiply in each processor. But remember, I need to do Gaussian elimination on a whole block column. That's in the inner loop of the algorithm. And there's only one processor that owns that whole block. So there's no parallelism there at all. So I have a sequential bottleneck for doing Gaussian elimination on each, on each column. So, so here is a possibility. Uh, this is called a skewed layout. So now it is load balanced, kind of, sort of. You know, it, it's, with four processors, it doesn't work so well. But basically, if you look at any trailing submatrix, they're usually spread out evenly among four processors. And there's all four processors share a column. All four processors share each row. So I have all, lots of parallels in there. But I'm, I, that's kind of messy uh, addressing, so I'm not going to use that. So here's another kind of two-dimensional layout. This has the same load balancing problem. Once I get to this half, there's no parallelism at all. And so finally, we get to this winner. That's the same winner we had before. I'm going to choose a block size. So each of these little submatrices is B by B. And this pattern, 0, 1, 2, 3, is just going to get repeated. So now, if I look at any trailing submatrix, it's perfectly load balanced. And I have a reasonable amount of parallelism in each column. I have square root of p processors participating in each column to parallelize it. And that's going to be, turn out to be perfectly good enough to hit the lower bound. So this is, is the layout. So now, the next two slides are just going to take the algorithm that I showed you before in the sequential case and describe how to run the exact same algorithm in parallel when the matrix is laid out this way. So I'm just going to write the code on this side and just draw a picture of what gets accessed and talk about what the communication is on this side. So I'm going to process the matrix in blocks of B columns. So this is the same loop that we had before from the beginning to the end in steps of B. And I'm going to process a block of B columns that range from column IB to column end. So the first thing I'm going to do, so there they are. So I'm going to process this bunch of B columns. This part is already finished. That part's already finished. And there are, in this picture, three processors that share that particular block column. So I need to do Gaussian elimination on this block column with these three processors. And I'm going to use the, 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 the BLAS2 algorithm. So I'm going to process it from left to right, one column at a time. So the first thing I have to do in column, once I get to column I, is find the biggest guy. That's a single call to MPI reduce. So what I need to do is say, please find me the largest entry in that column and uh, which entry it is. So it's MPI max, you know, find the max. And the black line indicates the data that participates. It's spread out over processors, so there's communication there. So find the pivot row and, bro and, and, and broadcast who owns it. Okay, so that's what that particular picture means. So now every processor, every one of these three processors knows, for example, that the biggest entry is maybe right there. It's owned by that processor. So the next thing I have to do is swap these rows. And everybody's going to need to know it. And so I'm going to broadcast this row to everybody else. So there's a single call to MPI broadcast. And so then everybody owns this copy of this row because they're going to need it. 
And then this processor uh, overwrites his row with that one, which has the biggest, di has the biggest entry. And then uh, this guy, there needs to be one more communication because this row has to be mo moved down there. They have to swap. So that's that line of code. The next thing I have to do is divide every column by the diagonal. Now, that's embarrassingly parallel. Every, every processor owns a subset of the column, and they divide by the diagonal entry, which they now all own a copy of. So that's embarrassingly parallel. And then I ha have to update the trailing submatrix. I have to do this, that column times that row and subtract it from that. And that, now everybody has all the data they need. Everybody independently, embarrassingly parallel calls BLAS2, rank one update. So that processor updates that submatrix, that processor updates that submatrix, and it all happens at the same time. So that's, and when I'm done, I've finished the LU factorization of just that block column, but only these three processors know what's going on, right? They haven't communicated to anybody else yet. So the next thing I have to do is tell all the other processors that I've permuted their rows. So I have to broadcast my, per, my list of permutations to the left and the right. So everybody, all the processors in these rows know what the permutations are. Then they have to swap all of their rows with their neighbors so that they can you know, reorder all the rows into the right order. So this, this is all very, lots of communication. But now I've updated the matrix. Everything is in the permuted order. And I get to the, the second and last line of, of code. So now I have my triangular matrix here. And what, remember, what, I, what do I need to do? I need to do a triangular solve with that triangle and all of those matrices. So I have to broadcast that lower triangular matrix to the right, so all these processors own a copy of it. So there's communication. Then everybody does a triangular solve. They solve the lower triangular matrix you know, inverse times their local pink matrix. That's all embarrassingly parallel. And finally, I get to where the lion's share of the work goes, the matrix multiply. I have to multiply that blue matrix times that pink matrix and subtract it from that green matrix, and that's a call to the parallel blahs, to the parallel matrix multiply. And it involves communicating these guys sideways, those pink guys down, and then I do matrix multiply. So that is hopefully where we're going to spend most of our time if I run this algorithm. So this is the classical way to do it. There's only, I haven't replicated any data, so I haven't done any clever stuff to minimize communication because of that. But let's, let's, let me show you some performance data, and then I'll show you some. Uh, let me show you some performance data, and then I'll show you some some formulas that say whether I've hit the lower bound or not in communication. So let me just remind you how fast matrix multiply goes, because this is going to be the inner loop, right? I can't go faster than matrix multiply, and so this is a slide from last time, and let's just look at the bottom part here. So here I have four different machines of some vintage. Here I have how fast they can do matrix multiply just locally, so the hand-tuned matrix multiply in a single processor. And what I'm going to measure is how fast the parallel matrix multiply goes compared to you know, the peak speed of the machine. So I'm going to measure it for different problem sizes, you know, 2,000 by 2,000, 4,000 by 4,000, and for different number of processors. And I'm going to compare the speed of the parallel matrix multiply with all the communication to uh, the you know, just matrix multiply all by itself. And so you can see all these numbers are less than one. And if I have a fixed problem size, like 2,000, I increase the number of processors, the communication starts to be a bottleneck, and I go from 73% efficient down to 58. But if I fix the number of processors and make the problem size bigger, then communication gets less and less important, and the efficiency increases again. It goes back up towards one. So this is going to be my building block, right? I'm just reminding you of this because we're going to see this same pattern in Gaussian elimination because this is the inner loop of Gaussian elimination, parallel matrix multiply. So now let me just show you the same data for, para for, for Gaussian elimination. It's the same four machines. It's going to be the same number of processors, the same problem sizes. And what I'm measuring here is how fast is parallel Gaussian elimination, PDGESV is the name of the parallel Gaussian elimination routine, and I'm dividing it by the time to do matrix multiply on a matrix of the same size. So this is, well actually, let me, let me do this one first. I'm doing megaflops, so raw speed. So this is the speed of Gaussian elimination, which is doing, of course, two-thirds n cubed flops, divided by the speed of matrix multiply, which is doing two n cubed flops. And so here's the pattern. It's the same as before. If I fix the problem size, n equals 2,000, and 
increase the number of processors, communication gets more and more dominant, and I go from 67% efficient compared to matrix multiplied down to 18% efficient. But if I fix the number of processors and increase the problem size, I spend more and more time doing flops, and the efficiency goes back up to a decent fraction of one. So that's what, so this is sort of the same picture. So this is sort of, so I'm saying that matrix multiply is, is the peak speed I can hope to go at since it's my inner loop, and I'm comparing my speed to that. And so here's just timing comparisons. So ideally, since matrix multiply does two n cube flops and Gauss elimination does two thirds, I would go three times as fast if I went at the same speed. And sometimes I go, you know, instead of a third, it's like 0.4. So it sort of has that, ten, you know, so it, it has the right behavior if the problem is large enough. But it can take longer to do solve a linear system, like 1.86 times longer, if, I'm, if it's a small problem on lots of machines. Okay, so this is, was the state of the art for a while, until we started worrying about minimizing communication and asking ourselves, does this hit the lower bound? And if not, can we do better? So let me talk, tell that story now. So, um, so what is the lower bound? So if I only have one copy of the data, the lower end, and it's, I'm doing n by n Gaussian elimination on p processors, it's the same as matrix multiply, the lower bound is n squared over root p word sent and root p messages. And we saw that matrix multiply attains that. So what about um, Gaussian elimination, the algorithm I just showed you? Well, if you do the careful counting, the number of words moved is not quite the lower bound, but it's only bigger by a factor of log p. And since we have all these sort of reductions with log p kind of stages in it, you know, that's not so bad to have a factor of log p. That's in the number of words sent. On the other hand, the latency cost, the number of messages is much worse. It's not square root of p, it's proportional to n. n can be arbitrarily larger than p, right? So this is really, you know, a large bottleneck. And so why is that? Well, when you think about the way the algorithm works, every time I get to a column, I have to say who's the biggest guy in the column. Right? I'd have to do that once per column, that's proportional to n, and each one is a reduction over square root of p processors, that's going to cost me log square root of p messages, so it's n log square root of p. And so as long as I'm doing partial pivoting, asking who's the biggest guy in each column, I'm kind of stuck with this much, much larger number than square root of p. So what I need to do is to abandon partial pivoting. On the other hand, I still have to pivot to get the right answer, so I have to have a, comp a different kind of pivoting algorithm. And so here is the idea, and uh, it's going to do uh, what we call um, tournament pivoting. So the goal now is for every time I have a panel of B columns spread over root P processors, I want to, in as little communication as possible, pick not just one good pivot row, pick B good pivot rows and put them at the top with sort of one communication step. And we're going to call this algorithm tall, skinny LU because it only works when you have a tall, skinny matrix spread out over a bunch of processors. And so let me uh, tell you and, and how to do it. And so let me suppose, so here's my tall, skinny matrix. It has N rows and B columns. And let me, just to keep the picture simple, assume that I only have four processors. So each processor owns a quarter of the rows of this matrix. So processor one owns the first you know, N over four rows and so forth. And so the first thing I'm going to do is, without any communication, I'm going to take each of these four indi in individual matrices and run Gaussian elimination with partial pivoting on them. So the algorithm I just showed you, but there's no communication, right? One processor does Gaussian, elim Gaussian elimination with partial pivoting. It factors it into a permutation times L times U. And when I'm done with that, in, uh, you know, four independent Gaussian eliminations, what I've done is I've chosen the B best rows of this guy, the B best rows of this guy. Each of these independent Gaussian eliminations has chosen the B most linearly independent rows from their submatrix, right? So I have now four B candidate rows that I could want to use. How am I going to do that? I'm going to run a tournament. Each one of them is going to compete with its neighbor, and I'm going to and eventually the B best rows will win. Okay, so let me call the best rows from this first group. Uh, w1 prime. I'll call the best B rows from that group W2 prime. And what I'm going to do is I will run a, run a little tournament. So these, so now I'm in the semifinals. I'll take the B best rows from processor 1, the B best rows from processor 2, pack them together. That's now a really tiny matrix. It's 2B by B. And I have to decide who's best. How do I decide? I run Gaussian elimination again. 
So I'll do a very tiny little Gaussian elimination and pick the best B of these two B rows by doing permutation times L times U. And I'll call the, the winners there uh, W1, 2. So this is now a little B by B matrix again. Same thing for processors 3 and 4. And now I get to the finals, and I take the B best rows from the top, the B best rows from the bottom, put them together. This is still a little 2B by B matrix. Run Gaussian elimination one last time, and now I've chosen the best B rows from all you know, from the entire set of n that I started with. So now that I've done that, I go back to the original data, take out the original B rows, and put them at the top, because I know that's what Gauss elimination, you know, that's the right thing to do. And now I can do LU with no more pivoting. And it works. And there's, uh, it works, but I have, but, you know, this is a different algorithm than partial pivoting. I do not choose the same pivots that I, the Gaussian elimination would have chosen, that partial pivoting would have chosen. So we still need a proof. I'll tell you in one line what the proof is later. You need to prove you still get a decent answer, that it's still numerically stable. So let me just say how this parallelizes over different architectures. So here's a cartoon of the algorithm I just described. Each processor owns a quarter of the rows of the matrix. And so basically all I'm going to do is call a reduction, MPI reduce, my reduction operation is going to be Gaussian elimination. So I take each matrix, I do Gaussian elimination, take each pair, move them up at the tree, do Gaussian elimination, take the pairs, move them up the tree. So it's just a reduction operation, except the reduction is take B rows from my one child, B rows from another child, put them together, pick B rows, and pass them up the tree. So that's the algorithm for the parallel case. But what about the sequential case, right? I also want to minimize communication in the, for the sequential algorithm. And so it's going to be exactly the same algorithm, but just with a different tree. So now, suppose that I have this big matrix, but I can only fit a quarter of the rows into cache at a time. So how am I going to do this? I only want to you know, move the data into cache once. So I bring in the first quarter of the rows, do LU, pick the B best. Then I bring in the next quarter of the rows, stack the first B that I had on top of them, and do LU one more time, and I get the next B rows. Then bring in the third quarter of the matrix, stack my best B rows on top of it, do LU one more time. And then, so, and by the time I'm done, I will have read this matrix from slow memory to fast memory exactly once and picked the best B rows. So I still have what I want. It, I'll, I may very well have chosen a different B rows from this tree than that tree, but that's okay. The, the proof says you'll still get a decent answer. So what if I have a, like maybe a dual core machine where I have some, so two parallel processors, running, and so I may have a different shape tree, so I may use that. You know, but what if I have a, a real computer, right, which is multi-core and multi-socket and multi-rack, you know, so a very complicated hierarchy. Well, I'll just choose a reduction, you know, the, the reduction tree dynamically, right? Depending on what hardware resources I'm given, I can use any shape tree I want because the proof tells me that I will still choose a good B rows when I'm all done at the end. Okay. So let me show you some performance data. So are there any questions about you know, this basic reduction algorithm? So, so, so the takeaway is that you know, in order to optimize parallel algorithms, sometimes it's just a matter of taking a classical sequential algorithm and scheduling it right, and sometimes you have to invent a new algorithm because it doesn't, the classical sequential one doesn't parallelize well. So here's some speed up numbers. These were measured. So let me show you the speed up of a tall, skinny LU compared to the, to the Blas 2 algorithm. And you can see that on these different platforms, there were like 4x speedups and 5x speedups. That's for a, a very tall, skinny matrix, a million by 150. And if we put the whole package together and integrate that into a square, dense matrix multiplication algorithm, and, and where we replace the usual you know, partial pivoting with this, then we get speedups that are more modest, but they're still useful speedups um, on on fairly modest sized matrices. So this is a lot of processors for a small matrix, but it goes quite a bit faster. So where is the real payoff for this likely to be? Let me show you a performance prediction. So we have all these formulas that sort of estimate the performance. So let me show you something that we actually haven't implemented, but could be an assignment uh, if you wanted to try it on Hopper. So this was a prediction we did before petascale machines existed. And so the question is, how fast are we going to run? How much faster are we going to be than the classical algorithm? And so this is all color-coded by you know, what speed up we get. And, and so the horizontal axis is the log of the number of processors from you know, one processor up to two to the 14th processors. And the vertical axis is a, is a problem size, again, on a log scale from, you know, this is 
uh, 10 cubed up to you know, 10 to the sixth you know, million by million processors. And the color code is, is, the t is the ratio of the speed up. So up here, and up here it's white because the matrix doesn't fit in the machine, right? So this, is, so this upper boundary is the largest matrix that fits on the machine. And up there, that's sort of the land of Linpack benchmark. It's all compute bound, there's no speed up, right? Because you're spending all your time doing arithmetic and the, and the communication doesn't matter so much because the communication is proportional to n squared and the computation is proportional to n cubed, so it doesn't matter if you're not optimal. But over here, where I'm trying to solve a modest sized problem on lots and lots of processors, that's where the communication gets to be the bottleneck. And the biggest speed up is right about there. It's up to 81 times faster, predicted. So this is a relatively small problem, you know, 50,000 by 50,000 on a lot of processors. And so, if you, so this is sort of a strong scaling problem. So if I keep the problem size fixed, that means I, I pick a row and I increase the number of processors, you see that's where the speed up really kicks in. So modest size problems on very large numbers of processors. Okay, so that's the end of the story just for Gaussian elimination. And I want to do a couple slide summary of what we know about all the other algorithms of linear algebra. But are there any questions about Gaussian elimination before I just sort of summarize everything else? Okay, so let me put up a couple of tables just to sort of summarize what we think we know about all the other algorithms. And so this is going to, and, and whether we can hit the lower bounds, whether we have algorithms that hit the lower bounds. And so I'll have one slide for the sequential case. Do we minimize you know, memory movement between main memory and cache? And, and so let me just sh show you this table. And I haven't, I'll show you the table in a moment. I'm going to distinguish between the case when we just have two levels of memory, so DRAM and cache, say, or disk and DRAM, and whether we can have an algorithm that hits the lower bound for the number of words moved, and whether it also minimizes the latency cost, the number of messages, because some algorithms will only minimize one and not the other. And, and LAPAC, and, and the, I showed you one example of that. And then I'll try to say, what about algorithms that are, work for any number of levels of memory hierarchy? You know, L1, L2, L3. Are there algorithms that minimize the number of words moved and the number of messages? And so I'm going to try to tell you that for all these different linear algebra algorithms, for matrix multiply and all its cousins, the BLAS3, for Koleski, so that's you know, Gauss elimination on a symmetric positive definite matrix, so no pivoting. Then LU with pivoting, I just told you about. Then there's the QR decomposition that comes up in uh, least squares problems. And there's a variation of it where you do rank revealing, where you permute the columns. And then the eigenvalue problem, both symmetric and non-symmetric, and the SVD. And so uh, some color coding here. Um, so if an algorithm is cache oblivious, I'm just going to underline it so you can see that was the idea that they used. Um, uh, red question marks, open work, don't know, and green ones are you know, our inventions. So here is an incredibly busy slide just to show you what the current state of the art is with sort of pointers to various algorithms. So for a matrix multiply, uh, basically we've already told you everything you need to know, the blocked algorithms or recursive algorithms, and uh, that, that works in two levels of memory. And they also work in multiple levels of memory. And the oldest reference that sort of explained how to do this, I think, goes back to 97 for, um, to Fred Gustafson for these cache oblivious algorithms, recursive ones. So what about Koleski? LAPAC does work uh, when you, if you pick the right block size for two levels of memory. And, uh, but it doesn't work for multiple levels of memory. And you have to use the cache oblivious version of Koleski. And, and that uh, has been around for a while. Um, so what about LU with pivoting? LAPAC works sometimes. I, I showed you that when the matrix is really, really big or really, really small. But it doesn't minimize the number of messages. And uh, then there's the recursive algorithm. That's Savan Toledo's uh, that, I, that I mentioned, the, where you div do divide and conquer left and right. That works for the minimizing number of words moved. And it, since it's cache oblivious, it works on any number of levels of memory. But uh, this, I should have changed this red question mark because as of you know, a few months ago, we did figure out how to modify it to actually minimize latency too. So whether it's, you know, but it may have a lot of overhead for doing that. And then the green stuff is the tournament pivoting business that I told you about where we have to change the pivoting scheme. For QR, there's another, uh, LAPAC is also works if the matrix is very, very large or very, very small. There's another uh, divide and conquer algorithm, which does, you know, splits the matrix in the left and the right. So it's very similar to the LU decomposition I told you about. 
Um, and then there's a, another version of that that, uh, that we came up with. Um, there's a, but it doesn't minimize the, num the latency. There's this older cache oblivious algorithm that does minimize both bandwidth and latency, but it triples the amount of floating point operations. So that's not necessarily a good thing to do because when the matrix is small you'll, and it fits in cache, you'll notice that you're doing three times as much work. And then finally, the eigenvalue in the SVD, no, uh, LAPAC was nowhere close. It does you know, order you know, vastly more communication. And there's a bunch of recent papers where we have figured out how to hit it, perhaps in, uh, sometimes using randomized algorithms. In particular, if it's a non-symmetric matrix, we have no idea how to do it other than by using a randomized algorithm. And so there's lots of open questions here. So that's the summary of the sequential state of the art. And there's various class projects there. So let me tell you what the parallel state of the art is. So I'm going, to, I'm going to start with the case where I have one copy of the data. So I have n by n matrices spread out over p processors. And I'm going to assume everybody has you know, exactly one piece of the data. And so here are my lower bounds. I'm going to ask, you know, can I hit them? And they're the same for you know, everything is matrix multiply, n squared over root p and root p. And so I'm going to give you I'm going to tell you this, what we know for matrix multiply, again, for Koleski, for Gauss elimination with pivoting, for QR, the symmetric eigenvalue problem and the non-symmetric one. I'll separate them this time because non-symmetric is much harder. And I'm going to tell you how close we get to the lower bound. So I'm going to give you a factor in here which says how much bigger than the lower bound we are. So if I have a 1 in here, that means we hit the lower bound. If I have a log P in here, that means we're probably close enough to the lower bound. And if it's in factor of N, we're really bad. So let me tell you about scale pack, uh, as in the current released library. So it turns out for everything except the non-symmetric eigenvalue problem, it is within a factor of log p of the lower bound for bandwidth. So that's pretty good, except for the non-symmetric one, and it's worse by a large factor. So, but where scale pack really falls down is in the latency cost, and there are factors of n in there. So it's sending vastly more messages than necessary. And for LU, I explained why, because it has this, you know, it has to do a reduction for every column, and they're n columns, and the other ones have similar problems. So for all of these, so these are the classical algorithms, and, oops, and here's some new ones. Okay, and here's some new ones that I have, and there are references for them, and they're all within a factor of log p or log qp in theory of the lower bound. And uh, some of them have been implemented, some of them have not, so there are indeed class projects available for all of those things, as you can imagine. Okay, so all of this assumed that M, I only had one copy of the data, right? And we know that you can do better if you have more copies of the data. And so let me just tell you what the current state of the art is when I have enough memory to have C copies of the data, because I know for matrix multiply that works. And now the lower bounds, as before, the latency lower bound goes down by a factor of C to the 3 halves. The bandwidth lower bound goes down by a factor of c to the 1 half. For matrix multiply, I told you the details. We're within a factor of, well, polylog means you know, log or log squared or log cubed. For Koleski, LU, and QR, we also hit that lower bound. But it turns out that this is the wrong lower bound for the number of messages. There's a new lower bound. And it turns out that for the number of messages for these algorithms, LU, QR, and Koleski, and it turns out the lower bound for the number of messages is p to the 1 half times c to the 1 half. So if you use replication, it turns out you send more messages. You, you move fewer words, but you have to send more messages if you insist on having multiple copies of the data. And so that means that the lower bound is not divided by c to the 3 halves. It's c squared bigger, and we can hit that. So there's you know, yet another piece of theory that says that you know, there's sort of a separate relationship for the lower bound and the number of messages. And we don't know about these guys yet. So that's sort of open questions. Okay, so I think that I only have a few minutes left, and there's, two to there's actually three possible topics and I, we, that we could choose among. One of them is the proof of the lower bound and sort of a sketch of why it's true. And the other two topics are how do you, some of the lower level details about how all this scheduling happens on a multi-core machine, because you want to express the algorithm in a DAG and sort of keep all the processors busy at the same time. And then there's GPUs, where uh, it turns out that you, you don't want to do all the work on the GPU. You have to split it up and do some of it on the CPU. It does some of the processing faster and some of it on the GPU. So we have three choices, and I'm happy to take a vote. Uh, abstention means we quit early, I suppose. Um, so we could talk about the proof. 
One, two, three, four, five. We could talk about multi-core. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five, six. All right. And then we could talk about GPUs. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. I guess uh, multi-core wins by one vote. All right. So let's talk about multi-core and how this all gets expressed. Um, so I'm going to re re-express re the algorithm using what's called a directed acyclic graph. And so I'm going to have a bunch of statements in the algorithm, and I'm going to have an arrow from statement one to statement two that means that one has to happen before two. So the question is, how do I take that and schedule it? And so let me use Koleski to illustrate this, because it's, it's easier. And so I'm going to do the, the version where I have every last scalar operation in here first to, to define the DAG, and then I'll go define it where I call matrix multiplies and, you know, and, and things like that in the inner loop. So here's, here's Koleski. It's on an n by n matrix. And for simplicity, I'll number it from 0, 0 to n minus 1, n minus 1. And so what do I do? This is called the left looking algorithm. So I start by updating the, the kth diagonal entry by taking the dot product. I'll have a picture in the next slide. This is the dot product of the kth row in itself. And I'll subtract that from the kth entry. I take its square root. And then I take the dot product of the, um, let's see, the nth column, excuse me, the nth and the kth column, and subtract it from that entry, and then divide. OK, so that's the code. It's just a different way of organizing the usual loops. Let me just draw the picture now, so make it a little easier to understand. So here is that same code. And there are one, two, three, four lines, four statements, that I need to order, do in the right order. So statement one, two, three, and four. And of course, there are many times, I execute the statement many times, so for every value of k and n defined by this loop, I'm going to execute this statement, so it's s1 of kn. So I have all of these different statements, and here's sort of a picture of all of these statements. So s1, as I said, is taking the dot product of this row with itself and subtracting from that entry, so I take that times that and subtract it from that. And s2 is taking the square root just to the diagonal entry. s3 is, is multiplying, it's a little hard to see, that guy times that guy and subtracting from that guy. So it's doing the dot product of that row and that row and subtracting. And then the last statement, S4, divides that entry by that entry. So those are all the statements, and here are all the arrows that define the dependencies. So I can't take the square root of this guy before I finish subtracting all the entries before it, before I finish this loop. So that means that statement S1 k comma n is going to have an arrow to statement s2 of k, because I have to finish all of these before I get to there. And similarly, there are lots and lots of arrows between the other ones. So in some sense, I have this graph where there's one vertex in the graph for every floating point operation. That's a lot of floating point, a lot of vertices. It's n cubed over 6. And so, and I can process that graph in any order that respects the arrows. Right? I can do any vertex as long as I've done all the guys whose arrows point into it. And, and the question is, how do I use that to assign work to processors? So this is clearly too much, right? This is, this is an enormous graph, right? It's as big as the whole problem in the first place. So what I'm going to do instead is process the matrix blockwise, right? So instead of doing a single multiply, I'm going to do a matrix matrix multiply. And I'm going to assign it to a whole processor. So what I'm going to do is assign this graph, which is going to be much, much smaller, to different processors to keep them all busy. So here is the same algorithm, except now, instead of looping from 0 to n, it's to n over the block size. And, so, and, in, in, and the square root of that diagonal entry turns into unblock Koleski on a square diagonal block. And that scalar multiply turns into a matrix multiply, and there's a transpose. And so basically, it's almost the same code, except now all of these submatrices are b by b blocks. And the DAG is no longer n cubed over 6. It's n over b cubed over 6, which is much, much smaller. And I can actually afford to schedule that in, in a clever way. And the picture here is, is the same picture, except now, instead of that being a scalar, that's a b by b block. So that's the way you should think of the algorithm. So now, let me draw the DAG that goes along with this. And I'm going to pick, n over, I'm going to pick b so that n over b is 5. And here is a picture of the DAG of that algorithm. So, the, so, here's the orid so this guy corresponds to Please do Koleski just on that leading little b by b block. All of these little purple blocks, let me see if I can read that. Those are, um, oops, let me back up. Um, those correspond to 
um, all of these matrix multiplies. And so what can I do first? I have to do that first. There's, this is the, there are no leading arrows that go into him. So I, before I do anything else, I have to do, do a, a, a sequential Kolesky factorization of the leading little n over b by n over b block. But once he's done, I can, do, I can schedule all of those in parallel, right? Because they only depend on him. I follow the arrows. He's done. So all of those four can be scheduled at the same time. Once they're all done, I can schedule the next layer. All of their inputs are finished. And I can work my way down through the DAG in any order that respects the dependencies and keep all the processors busy. So the question is, how do I actually do the scheduling? A lot of people have built systems to do this. So there are a lot of, since this is such a common pattern, it's hardly just for linear algebra for that matter, people have built a lot of systems where you can define DAGs automatically and ask the system to schedule it across a bunch of multi-core processors. And so the next slide is kind of a systems -y slide where I say, what are the scheduling options that people have actually explored for doing this? And then I'll show you some performance data. So one thing you could do is build that entire DAG ahead of time and then pre-assign all the tasks to processors. And you know, where, you, where you try to keep everything load balanced and make sure everybody finishes at exactly the same time. So that's good if you have complete control over your system and no processor ever gets interrupted to do anything else, which is pretty common in the world, right? So that's why people also have dynamic uh, load balancing where only the idle processors grab ready jobs from a work queue because some processors may get taken away from you by the operating system. And in that case, you want whichever ones you have left to be able to keep busy. So that's a dynamic approach. So then there's a question of do you respect locality? You'd like the processor that already owns the data to do the work. And some of these DAG scheduling software systems work better than others. Some of them build the entire enormous DAG, which was of this size, to schedule it ahead of time, which is a big optimization problem. And other ones, just build a little bit of it at a time, so they might only build the next layer and schedule it. And that is a lot less overhead, but they have less information to optimize. And then there's the question of who's responsible for building the DAG in the first place. So sometimes they build the DAG for you automatically. They look at all of your subroutines, they look at the input arguments and the output arguments, and they automatically figure out who depends on whom, and it's all invisible to you. That's very friendly. And other ones uh, depend on you to do it. So there are a lot of different systems out there. So let me just give you some performance data. I'm going to compare three different systems that people have built. One of them is called Silk, which is built by Charles Leiser at MIT uh, and was acquired by Intel, I believe. And so this uh, does work stealing. It will steal busy processors, uh, excuse me, idle processors will steal work from busy processors. Um, SMPSS, I think, was built at the Barcelona Supercomputer Center. Um, it, you can annotate your tasks to help it figure out what the dependencies are. And then Plasma, uh, by uh, colleague Jack Dongera at Tennessee and his team, um, the programmer has to sort of build in the uh, dependencies. So let me just show you the performance data. And sorry, I'm running over. So this is Kolesky. The horizontal axis is time. So the farther to the left, the sooner you finish. This is a four processor uh, platform. So there are four cores. And each line is color coded by what the core is busy doing at any particular time. And so these are the different subroutine calls. This is sequential Kolesky. This is triangular solve, BLAS3. This is a matrix multiply. These are two different flavors of matrix multiply. And all the white time is idle time, where the processor is not doing anything, so it's badly load balanced. And you can see the best thing is when everything is tightly packed together, and so plasma happened to win at this, for this particular application. And let me just give you some other uh, variations on, on some different platforms. You can see that, uh, again, this one worked out the best. And finally, one more piece of uh, performance data. This is taking a, um, a quad socket quad core, so 16 core Intel multi-core system, and it compared Plasma to these other systems. It, it, again, Plasma came out the best. You can tell who gave me these slides, the people who built Plasma. And finally, let me compare um, Plasma to the other ways of getting parallelism, one is LAPAC, where all the parallelism is hidden inside the matrix multiply. So when you call matrix multiply, it uses all the cores, but nothing else is parallel. To scale a pack, that, that other parallel algorithm, running on your multi-core machine and doing message passing, but the message passing is smart enough to know that it's shared memory. And then there's the DAG scheduling. And again, up is good, it's megaflops, and it wins. So. Let me say that there's uh, lots of different scheduling tools that are people are still building and lots of class projects. 
uh, and, and questions about how to build these. And, and the goal is to have a single scheduling system that you would use on your multi-core platform or your big distributed memory machine. And so you'd have portable performance and, and write the code once. That's sort of the, the ultimate goal. So um, I will stop here.